I am so pleased and honoured to be able to introduce to you now Mark Crispin Miller. Mark is a media studies professor at New York University. And we've been very blessed to have so many guests that all have a different area of expertise. We are yet to have anybody whose area of expertise is media. So Mark is about to share his insight with us. Welcome to the stream, Mark. I've just unmuted you. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to uh, meet you more or less face to face. And I'm honored to be part of this uh, visual, you know, uh, for Julian and um, free speech in general. Thank you, Mark. I should let you know, I'm, my name is Susie Dawson. I've been emailing back and forth with you for a few days. Elizabeth Lee Voss, Editor-in-Chief of Disobedient Media, will be joining us soon and will likely take over the interview with you, but I'm just filling in in the meantime. Um, but I'm actually very happy to because media is very much my thing and I'm kind of looking forward to picking your brain about it. Um, so this vigil has been unique in that we've brought together people of completely different political stripes, experience, affiliations and opinions because we've united them on the single focus of press freedom and human rights for Julian Assange and for WikiLeaks. What can you tell us about the last 10 years of WikiLeaks publishing history and the way that they have been treated by the mainstream media? Well, uh, clearly, uh, the media has, on the one hand, always been uh, uh, pleased to exploit uh, the material that WikiLeaks has, has released. Uh, some, you know, exploited more selectively than others. You know, it's interesting to compare the way the New York Times uh, has covered uh, WikiLeaks revelations with how uh, press outlets abroad have done so. Uh, at any rate, while taking uh, full commercial advantage, and I should add journalistic advantage of what WikiLeaks has revealed, uh, they have simultaneously never hesitated to um, attack Julian Assange, to demonize him uh, for his uh, temerity in contradicting the uh, official U.S. propaganda line um, I mean, it, it is at best grossly hypocritical of them to do this. Uh, and, and just in moral terms, it's shocking uh, that they would um, first pile on him uh, over nothing, essentially. And let me uh, parenthetically recommend to all who are tuning in today uh, the terrific um, expose of the Swedish case against Julian by my friend Celia Farber. Uh, who um, actually is a fluent speaker of Swedish and knows Sweden uh, and um, was therefore able to write a really terrific uh, analysis of, of not only the uh, bogus case against Julian Assange in Sweden, but the whole history of how it, how it uh, came to be. It's sort of required reading, I think, for anyone who wants to understand the propaganda drive against Julian Assange, you know. Uh, so that's that's a very important thing to mention today. Um, but, you know, having done all that, having piled on him in that way, they're now uh, either silent in the face of this grotesque mistreatment of, of Julian or even gloating over it. Um, you know, it, it shows a level of callousness and um, of... Um, real disinterest, or I should say uninterest in, in free speech rights that, that should uh, give us all pause, to, to, to put it mildly. I mean, the press is, is, they have a lot to answer for, it seems to me. And the fact that we have to do this uh, in order to call attention to what's going on is, um, I mean, I'm delighted to do it, but don't you wish we didn't have to do it? I mean, they, they should be you know, the, the media system that ritually congratulates itself for its own bravery, that gives us movies like The Post, you know, about the Washington Post's uh, supposedly heroic uh, publication of the Pentagon Papers. You know, that kind of self-congratulation uh, is a little hollow when you consider uh, how they've reacted to the um, West's uh, grotesque persecution 
of Julian Assange, who has been basically committed to providing the people of the world with as much truth as possible. So that's what I would say in answer to your question there. So as John Pilger said, he is guilty of performing the task and role that the media are supposed to perform, and for that reason, he is loathed by them. Well, I think that's a very that's a very acute point. You know, deep down, maybe very deep down, at some level, many of them uh, have to know that he is showing them up, that he is doing what they should be doing, and since they're um, I think almost without exception, sellouts, you know, if not actual assets or agents themselves, they naturally uh, detest him for, for what he's doing. You know, I mean, it's, an, a, it's a kind of familiar psychological uh, uh, syndrome we're, we're dealing with here. But they're, they're I think, fired by their uh, hatred of him for doing what, as John says, they, they ought to have been doing all along. Absolutely. And I mean, I find it very fascinating that you've just already brought up the point about them being agents in some cases, because we do know, I mean, there was the famous German case of the um, journalist who came out and said, look, I've, I've been doing these guys' will for the last 25 years, and yes, I've been rewarded for it and, and um, paid for it, remunerated for it. Um, I think, right. Yes. Yeah, who's no I longer think, with us, right? Unfortunately, that is correct. Yeah. That is correct. Right. Um, well, there's so much to say about this. Um, sh- shall I uh, talk by about all, By all means, because I think it's entirely reasonable, especially given the amount of anonymous intelligence sources that are being cited by, for example, in recent weeks, The Guardian and hit pieces about WikiLeaks. I think it's entirely within the realm of reason to imagine that these uh, these journalists are not spontaneously deciding to smear WikiLeaks, but there is actually more coordination going on behind the scenes to generate all of this bad press. Oh, there is no question about it. There is no question about it. If, if an analogous uh, propaganda came out of Russia, nobody in our press system would hesitate for a moment to suggest, to suggest to scream that that was uh, centrally organized, right? I mean, or China, for example. Yeah, it's happening here in the citadel of free pre- of uh, press freedom. You know, the land of the First Amendment. Um, there's a kind of film over people's eyes that they they are there there's something missing from their brains that they can't see how clearly orchestrated these things are. I mean, look, um, we've known since, at least since uh, 1977, when uh, Carl Bernstein wrote his famous, and at the time, uh, grossly underreported cover story in Rolling Stone that uh, some 400 American journalists had been employed by the CIA, had been doing CIA work. Uh, the piece was a bit of a limited hangout because Bernstein, while he did you know, give us this eye-popping revelation. That's a very high figure, 400, 400 plus. He also suggested on the one hand that they weren't doing it anymore. So it was something that they had done, but no longer did. And even more significantly, he, he suggested very strongly that the work that these journalists did for the CIA was mainly espionage. That is to say, they would go abroad, uh, they would go behind the Iron Curtain, they would be used by the CIA uh, as eyes and ears in these places, and then would come back and brief uh, the agency and tell them what they had seen. Now, now that's regrettable, that's you know, uh, unacceptable, journalists shouldn't be functioning as instruments of intelligence agencies, and it also put journalists at risk because that kind of a program would naturally arouse the suspicions of governments in places like the Soviet Union. So it wasn't, it was unethical. But all those wrongs pale in comparison to the greater wrong that these journalists were actually committing, which was to do propaganda for the CIA, to do propaganda for the CIA. In other words, to, to uh, uh, 
insinuate the CIA's own material into news broadcasts and articles that were intended for the American readership and, and, and viewing audience. This Bernstein only hints very, very obliquely in one footnote that you have to read about six times to get the point of what he's saying. So the piece, as I say, is a kind of a limited hangout. Nevertheless, if we uh, overlook that, we can say that we have known since 1977, we meaning the average educated uh, person, uh, we have known that the CIA has been in the business of uh, recruiting uh, journalists to do their work, to do their propaganda work. This was something that the Church Committee uh, and the Pike Committee, both those congressional committees, had discussed to some extent in their respective reports. And we can also say, if we look back at seminal historical events like the assassination of John Kennedy, and then the assassination mm -hmm. of Martin Luther King, and then the assassination of Bobby Kennedy, it's the 50th anniversary of that is, is approaching, we can say with perfect confidence that the press in each case and ever since those murders has been in, in jaw-dropping lockstep in promoting the official story of those crimes. And, and in each case, the official story is ludicrous. It is, it is com completely incredible. It has long since been demolished by whole libraries of counter evidence. And yet as far as the members, the, the personnel of our free press are concerned, uh, it's as if not, not a week has gone by since those assassinations occurred. They are still hammering the official story. As far as I'm concerned, that makes abundantly clear that we don't have a free press and that the press uh, is actually an extension of the government. And we could go on uh, through other incidents and episodes in our post-war history, obviously 9-11, uh, the shoot down of TWA Flight 800. Uh, repeatedly, we have seen the press uh, utterly unanimous, univocal in its support of a government-approved propaganda line. And, and that, I think, helps us understand why what has happened to Julian Assange has happened to him. Uh, and it isn't just that, you know. Because uh, he's threatening that entire infrastructure by sharing the actual truth. He's well, jeopardizing the, the entire infrastructure behind the empire of lies. Well, yeah, yeah propaganda does not want an argument. It's important to understand that there's a, a, a significant difference between propaganda and persuasion. When, you, when you're talking about persuasion, uh, you're talking about a rhetorical practice. You're talking about an oratorical practice. You're talking about uh, a context in which there are speakers each attempting to bring the audience around to his or her point of view. And they're arguing with each other. Okay. So it, it is a, a competitive oratorical effort. Uh, you don't just simply shoot the people, uh, you know, ma making different arguments you engage with them. And that's what free speech is supposed to be all about. That's what the so-called marketplace of ideas is all about. That's, that's an attempt to persuade people. Propaganda does not want to persuade. It wants to sway. It wants to um, move you, uh, preferably without your even being aware of it. It's not even, uh, it, it's, it's least effective when it's overt, when it comes at you as propaganda, it's most effective when it comes at you as something else, when its propagandistic character is disguised. So it comes at us as journalism. It comes at us as entertainment. And it comes at us as commentary, you see? So be precisely because the United States has a tradition of um, uh, uh, press uh, practices that are not controlled by the government overtly, you see, Propaganda in the United States is actually more effective. I'd say propaganda in the West has been more effective than the propaganda practices of so-called closed societies like China okay, or, or Cuba. I mean, in China, if the government wants to shut out a competitive point of view or a contradiction of its uh, official narrative, they just sh shut it out. I mean, they, 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 can, they, they police the internet. 
you know, they have uh, thousands and thousands of, of officers, uh, you know, online every moment, keeping their eagle eyes peeled for any kind of contradictory content, and they will get rid of it when they find it. You can't quite do that in the West, you see. You need to be um, uh, more inventive, more ingenious, and find other ways to try to shut off uh, contradictions of the official narrative. In other words, to suppress dissidents. And what we're seeing in the United States now, and this is a point I wanted to make with you today, is uh, a, a, a very comprehensive, uh, sophisticated, various, and inexplicit censorship. And the silencing of Julian Assange is just one piece of it, you see. Now, I, I, I think the last thing that Julian tweeted had to do with Catalonia, if I'm not mistaken. But that's not the reason why they pulled the plug on him. They pulled the plug on him, um, it, generally speaking, because as you said earlier, he has been, um, a, you know, uh, basically a, a, a monkey wrench in the works for years. He's been providing material that the, that the government wants uh, uh, hidden. But I think more specifically, they decided that the time had come to pull the plug on him because he was uh, uh, raising serious questions about the Skripal and Russiagate narratives, okay? Th this is what we have to understand, is that, again, in as much as propaganda does not want contradiction, we have to understand what the propaganda narrative has been over the last couple of years that would lead the state to take so radical a step as to silence Julian Assange. And that propaganda narrative has had various components that all fit very tightly together. One is Russiagate. One is the, uh, the myth that Russia hacked the American election in order to put Donald Trump in the White House. Now, very tightly wired to that narrative has been the narrative of Assad committing horrendous acts of uh, uh, brutal repression against his own people, massacring them with barrel bombs and chemical weapons and so on, and uh, b bombing hospitals along with its patron, Russia, okay? Tied to that, uh, then, more recently, has been the Skripal poisoning in Salisbury. And that, too, is a highly dubious story but it, it, it fits with the rest of it in a kind of a rational way. And propaganda narratives are never entirely rational. That Russia is, is, is a force of insidious indirection and toxic uh, uh, insidiousness. You see that they have befouled the pure waters of American democracy by uh, hacking our election in ways that have never been adequately explained. Um, they have poisoned uh, Skripal and his daughter. And relatedly, uh, Assad has been poisoning his people with gas attacks. Now, if, if you examine these narratives, any single one of them, if you pick out any one of these narrative strands and examine it rationally and look at evidence for it and evidence against it, you discover that it, it just none of it adds up. It's, it's complete crap. It, it doesn't really hold together. It's, it's actually laughable. But if you're sort of watching the spectacle through half-closed eyes and not really paying attention, which is the way most of us take in the news, you know, if you're that inattentive, if you're not really, you know, looking carefully and thinking carefully about uh, what you're being fed, you will sort of buy it all. Putin if you read the if you read the headline and move on, if you read the headline and move on, you hear the first five minutes on CNN. You listen to the garbage on national public radio. I mean, it doesn't really matter. They're all giving us the same information. Okay, then you you you, you get the point. You get the narrative. You believe it because we live in the land of free speech and so on. Now, let me go through the various things that the state has been doing to protect its propaganda narrative from uh, destruction or, or even from any question. One thing has been to pull the plug on Julian Assange. That is absolutely true. But he's not the only object of their um, aggression. 
They have all also mounted, as, as you, you suggested earlier, various smear campaigns against other dissident journalists, people like Vanessa Bealey, uh, Eve Kareen Bartlett, Patrick Henningsen, uh, people like me and others. Uh, we are, we are uh, demonized in, in media outlets like The Guardian, like The New York Times, a comedian like Lee Camp on RT, a very smart, funny guy, but he contradicts the official narrative. So the New York Times does a hit piece on him. I mean, the list of those of us uh, who have been attacked and discredited uh, uh, is com comfortingly long. I mean, there are quite a few people who are people like you, you know, people like others who are joining us today. I love that. I absolutely love that. Comfortingly long. That's yeah. it. It's if, not the just, goal was to, if the goal was to isolate us, then at least in that aspect of their methodology of oppression, they have utterly failed. <laughs> so far. And never say never. <laughs> at any rate, um, that, that's, that's okay, so there's Julian's fate. Then there's this, the, the various smear campaigns against all the rest of us. But there's also been, at the same time, uh, this vigorous effort to shadow ban us uh, through the social media, so that if you do a search on any of our names on Google, uh, you'll have a hard time finding any material about us other than attacks on us, because Google has changed its algorithms to bury our work and to foreground uh, other work that, that, that attacks ours. Uh, similar things uh, are happening on Facebook. Uh, I myself uh, used to get, you know, hundreds and hundreds of notifications every day. I have, uh, technically speaking, some 5,000 friends on Facebook. But um, lately, I've been getting a, f a few dozen a day. I don't hear from people. Uh, people who expect to read my stuff daily on Facebook now never see it. Uh, so uh, there too, Facebook, which we know is working with the Atlantic Council, uh, which the CIA listens to. Um, Facebook uh, is also working closely with the government of Israel to keep a tight rein on critics of, of uh, you know, Israeli policy, stuff that's happening in Gaza. We see similar things happening at YouTube and at, on Twitter, so that all four of the pillars of the so-called social media establishment, all being privately owned, are part of a general campaign of silencing those who would um, question uh, or counter the official narrative. Uh, so these are all various aspects of the same, I would say increasingly desperate push to keep the propaganda, the propaganda narrative protected from contradiction at all costs. And this, let me add, finally uh, helps explain the strange doggedness with which outlets like the New York Times, for example, will stick to the official narrative, even after themselves publishing uh, uh, news that would seem to have demolished the narrative or contradicted it. I mean, the New York Times did do uh, some big pieces on the practices of Cambridge Analytica uh, and its enormous theft of uh, personal data from Facebook in order to uh, help uh, elect Donald Trump. This is a British firm supported by uh, American billions, but uh, even though it clearly puts anything that Russia may arguably have done deep in the shade, the Times, uh, having reported this stuff about Cambridge Analytica, just returned uh, uh, with a kind of psychotic persistence to the Russiagate narrative and kept hammering Russia uh, over its uh, you know, alleged crimes against American democracy. So that kind of uh, single-mindedness also explains, uh, or also I should say it also illuminates uh, the fact that the assignment of the press these days has nothing to do with informing the people. It has nothing to do with telling the people what the people need to know to function in a democracy. It has nothing to do with telling people what they need to know for their own you know, social, economic, and physical welfare. It has nothing to do with any of that. What it has to do with, uh, above all, 
is helping the government drive home the propaganda narratives that it wants all of all of us to be absorbing with the ultimate goal of control control of the civic population well i i think that the control is a given as far as they're concerned they're they're desperate for control each of the propaganda drives they're pushing has its own various objectives i mean there's clearly an attempt to bring on some kind of war with Russia. Uh, there seems also to be uh, a, a, a more delayed uh, program of some kind of uh, conflict with China. Uh, you know, I, I would also include things like the Parkland phenomenon and the March on Washington by those kids. Uh, whenever something like that makes the cover of Time magazine and gets universally laudatory coverage throughout the press, I'm immediately suspicious. Uh, there, I, I, you know, have come around to uh, agreeing to some extent with people on the right who say that there is actually a drive uh, from on high to uh, do away with the Second Amendment. I, I no longer laugh that off as I used to do. I think there's some truth to it. I also think that things like Parkland have the aim beyond gun control of fostering and hardening divisions uh, within the American uh, electorate, uh, because as you noted at the beginning of our conversation, it is crucially important for people to join hands and join forces across ideological lines that kind of uh, solidarity among have-nots, I believe, is crucially important. And if you, if you actually pay close attention to the march on Washington and what its star uh, figures were saying, people like David Hogg were saying, you, you notice that it had far less to do with gun control, per se, than it had to do with demonizing uh, conservatives, attacking people on the right. Uh, uh, scolding them for their um, opposition to abortion, for example, uh, constantly making inflammatory statements about the Republican Party. That's an, an odd way to argue if you're really interested in promoting any kind of reform agenda on Capitol Hill, you'd think you would be trying to bring both parties together towards some legislative action. But the rhetoric of the march was, was pointedly divisive, which leads me to suspect that that, that and, and, and uh, many other of the spectacular uh, uh, incidents of the last year or so have actually had that as an aim. So I just want to reemphasize that, that the overall aim may be to further harden their control or tighten their control over the public. There are also a, a range of other agendas that these propagandas are meant to promote. And if you want to know what they are, just read the New York Times every day. It becomes <laughs> clear what they are. I, I think I can give you quite a visceral image um, of, of what you're describing in terms of division and in terms of the net effect. So during the Occupy movement, we saw protesters facing off against police. In the wake of the 2016 election, we see protesters facing off against other protesters while the police stand on the sidelines and basically eat popcorn. So this is the net effect of division, is that no longer are we protesting the state and opposing the state forces, but we are protesting each other and opposing each other um, to all, the almost net effect of indemnifying the state forces from even being involved in the conflict. That's absolutely true. Um, I, I think that that's, that's clearly the game plan here, is to encourage us to blame uh, other citizens for our problems, you know, and this is something that you see just as much on the so-called left as on the right. And it does indeed relate to what you and Cynthia were discussing at the end of your exchange about infiltration, you know, that there are, there are people among us who are actually not about, uh, trying to, um, focus mass attention on the real source of our problems. You know, Caitlin Johnston, who I understand has been or will be part of this today. Yes, yeah, she'll, be, she'll be speaking later tonight. Okay, well, you, you know, and many people who are tuning in know that she has taken a great deal of abuse from a circle of people at Counterpunch. That has always struck me as 
as not only bizarre and, and uh, sort of um, utterly unjustified, but highly suspicious, you see. <laughs> here is someone who, you know, passingly uh, said something not condemnatory about Mike Cernovich, right? And made the point, which I think is perfectly reasonable, that on certain issues, for very limited purposes, temporarily, it is wise to make common cause with people on the right. This is an argument that Ralph Nader has been making since the late 90s. He even wrote a book about it because he had, on certain issues, teamed up with Phyllis Schlafly of the Eagle Forum. I mean, few people are as right wing as she was. And in fact, I think uh, her last public statements were fervent support uh, express fervent support for the alt-right, you know. She's about as right-wing as they come. But it, to get Channel One out of the schools, this was this commercial daily broadcast for American public schools, to cut back on corporate power, Ralph believed it made sense to make common cause with people like that. Uh, and this is the same thing that Caitlin has been saying. And for this, she was... Um, he really viciously attacked by these guys at Counterpunch. Uh, and I thought that that was suspicious. And I continue to think it's suspicious. I think that kind of sectarian purism is a big distraction from the kind of common effort we desperately need to mount across the board. Uh, and liberals, self-described liberals, are allergic to that kind of discussion. Uh, I think it's necessary. And I think that um, the fact that there are so many uh, different ways in which that common enterprise has been thwarted uh, is, is one we should be thinking about very, very seriously. Because, you know, from my research, I've discovered, and I'm not the first to make this point, that the attempt to shatter uh, efforts by the have-nots overall toward economic justice and against war and in defense of the environment. Uh, uh, that kind of effort has been very, very carefully uh, subverted since the late 60s by uh, assets, agents of the state who have used various identity politics uh, positions to drive a wedge into the movement, you know? Uh, Ron Karenga, the inventor of Kwanzaa, was a very vocal Afrocentrist and a loud, hostile critic of the Black Panther Party. And it turns out that he was on the government payroll. There are a lot of examples. As, as were, as were um, people inside the Black Panther Party who were responsible with um, arming them. Uh, oh, that's right. That's obtaining, right. We obtaining weapons and arm arming them. So there you see that you have government agents attacking them externally and government agents um, subverting them internally. Well, that's right. Um, one of the most interesting things that I've learned in recent years um, was from public FIA documents that came out of the fusion centres in the United States that proved that the fusion centres were monitoring, infiltrating and subverting both left and right-wing activist causes simultaneously, in particular the pro-choice and the pro-life movements, which, which means this issue of abortion, they are actively monitoring and subverting both sides of the issue. So it's not even that the state is taking one ideological position and undermining the opposite, but actually they are undermining any activism at all which might disturb the status quo. That's right. They're not committed to any particular ideological position. They're interested in, in solidifying their power. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about elites, now wealthier than ever, uh, that are concerned above all with, with protecting their own privilege and their own supremacy. That's, that's what they're doing. Let me add to your example of the simultaneous funding of both sides of the abortion debate something that Malcolm X uh, went public with just a couple of months before his murder. He had discovered uh, that the Nation of Islam uh, was being funded by H.L. Hunt, the oil billionaire, who was also funding the Ku Klux Klan. Okay, now Malcolm was 
you know, troubled to begin with by the fact that Elijah Muhammad was routinely engaging in pedophile practices and so on. This, this disgusted and offended Malcolm and was one major reason why he left the Nation of Islam. But more uh, structurally, he was deeply troubled by his discovery that they were taking money from this ultra right wing billionaire you know, who's been connected to the Kennedy assassination, who was a close friend of J. Edgar Hoover's. So Malcolm went public with this uh, revelation in a talk, you can find it on YouTube, a couple of months before he was murdered. And let me bring the conversation back to that decade to make the point that um, not only Malcolm, but, but Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy and John Kennedy, all or each, had the potential to unify the American electorate. Each of them had broad appeal, and all four of them were in, in different ways and to varying degrees opposed to the war agenda of the military industrial complex and the um, increasingly inequitable and exploitative practices of American corporations and Wall Street. They all had that in common. Uh, Malcolm had transcended the, uh, the sort of Afrocentrism of his early years, was moving towards a broader approach toward human beings, as he puts it at the end of his autobiography. Martin Luther King, of course, and you wouldn't know this from reading all the plaudits on his 50th anniversary, the 50th anniversary of his death, but he was no longer focused solely on civil rights and, and integration of lunch counters in the South. He had moved on to work for economic justice for all have-nots and was the first important American public figure to speak out against the war in Vietnam. Mm. Uh, they, you know, Bobby Kennedy had appeal among working class whites and black people. Uh, John Kennedy's uh, moves toward peace were terribly popular in this country. Uh, the American people liked it as much as the military industrial complex and the intelligence agencies and the Pentagon disliked it. I believe that all four of them uh, were marked for death precisely because of their potential to you know, move the American people in the right direction through democratic means, you see? So it makes perfect sense that the same elites that would have in one way or another seen to the murder of those four crucial figures and others as well, like, you know, Fred Hampton, the chairman of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party, Thomas Merton, you know, the, the great um, uh, theological, I call him a divine, I suppose, mystic, who was, you know, very, very eloquent on behalf of peace. Uh, there was a lot, a lot of this premature death going around in that decade, but it didn't stop with that. It extended to the kinds of um, COINTELPRO infiltration uh, that we're talking about now, that you divide the left, that whenever necessary, you, you, you know, create uh, figures who can keep us fighting with one another as opposed to, uh, you know, joining hands with our fellow citizens toward a productive end. So the net effect of all of this, in terms of the propaganda, the manipulation of the narratives, um, is that it actually manufactures a false history. Like when, when we're from where we're sitting now, going back 50 years, you're talking about the, leg the subversion of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It is actually, um, and I'm also struck by the current issues with Wikipedia that have been... Um, unearthed by Craig Murray amongst other people this on a massive scale the manipulation of public information which is relied upon by academics by students high school students even primary school students all around the world by the millions are consuming tailored I mean I guess we can just call it outright propaganda and one thing that I find fascinating is that we now have the Council on Foreign, Council on Foreign Relations openly saying that we need propaganda in order to have a, a, our society, to maintain our society, that we require propaganda um, as if it's vitamin D or something. 
<laughs> well, I mean, there well, is, yeah, you know, that, that, that is a cynical variant on, on, a, on an argument that in itself isn't necessarily so perverse, which is simply that societies, uh, nations, cultures n- need their inspiriting mythologies. You know, you, 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 you need various mythologies in order to um, uh, sum up a sense of common purpose and so on. I mean, these things can be quite benign. And I think even our, many of our political heroes have also embraced various mythologies. I mean, nostalgia in itself is not a bad thing because without the idea that things were once better, in certain ways, it's it's much harder to make an argument that they can get better than they are today. You see, so I mean, there is underneath that really cynical argument uh, by the Council on Foreign Relations and and their kind, uh, a more general and more benign notion of 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 myth and and how peoples forge myths that keep them going and give them a sense of identity. But the important distinction here is that those are myths forged by the people. They are, they are expressions of, of uh, you know, the popular will, if you want to put it that way. Whereas propaganda campaigns are devised by elites in order to control people. And they are disseminated through extremely sophisticated means uh, through a complicit mass media system and a completely uh, corrupted journalism, you see. Journalists should not be in the business of forging and promoting any propagandas of any kind. They should be giving us accurate information about matters that are crucial to our welfare and our functioning as a democratic system. So it is true that that the Council on Foreign Relations and others have become more explicit in basically telling us that we had better accept propaganda it is good for us. It is like our, uh, you know, the daily tonic that we have to take in order to stay well. The fact that they say this is, as far as I'm concerned, a clear indication uh, or, a, or a, a, it betrays a kind of desperation that I find increasingly obvious as I try to read the New York Times every morning and, and try to watch things like CNN and MSNBC. There is a, there is a clear desperation there. They know that they have lost control of the narrative. They know that they have very, very little mass support. They know that their standing in the eyes of the public is um, laughable. They are... The emperor is naked. The emperor is naked and everybody sees it, you know. Everybody except the people who work for these press organizations, it seems. I mean, I think they have to tell themselves that they are working on uh, true... Uh, uh, news as opposed to fake news. I think that that's probably a psychological necessity for them. So that those who are complicit in all of this half believe what they're telling us to be the truth. Otherwise, they couldn't do it. Whereas the vast majority of the American people, and I think other peoples in the West, see through it. They know that it's crap. You know, they do. They know it. And um, what we're, we're living in a really I suppose you could say, interesting moment of crisis that I believe is unprecedented. I mean, for decades, Americans have basically accepted the idea that certain deviations from the official line on key events, like the Kennedy assassination, uh, are, are crazy, are conspiracy theory. And this has to do with the successful um, promotion of that meme conspiracy theory by the CIA starting in 1967 uh, as a way to counter uh, various uh, critics of the Warren Commission report. And and for your uh, audience, I want to recommend an indispensable book about this propaganda drive called Conspiracy Theory in America by Lance DeHaven Smith. This is a book that I am proud to say I asked Lance to write for a series I was editing at the University of Texas Press. It is an indispensable history of how and why the CIA came up with this concept of conspiracy theorists as people self-evidently warped, corrupt, venal, dishonest, 
and dangerous, uh, doing the bidding of communist uh, overlords abroad and so on. The CIA came up with this notion that anyone who questioned the Lee Harvey Oswald narrative on Dallas 63 is a conspiracy theorist. It is conspiracy theory. And from that moment on, right up to the present, uh, the press continued to use that meme as a kind of cudgel against people questioning the King and Kennedy assassinations and all the other events that we've talked about earlier today. So by now... Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, interestingly, there seems to be like a time limit on how long they can uh, capitalize on the conspiracy theory agenda. For example, for many years, I would say 20, 25 years, it was considered a conspiracy theory that elites in the UK were engaged in pedophilia and child sex trafficking rings, et cetera, et cetera. That when I became an activist, that was on the tail end of us being told, no, all the, all the victim testimony is, you know, crazy conspiracy theory, blah, 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 to smear the elites, blah, 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 blah. Sure enough, it wasn't conspiracy theory. It resulted in the CS inquiry, CSA inquiry in the UK. And we now know that, in fact, that was all the case. When um, Also, early on, when I became an activist, we were told that fracking causing earthquakes is total conspiracy theory. Fracking has nothing to do with earthquakes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Sure enough, we get to the point a few years later where even the US Department of Energy is forced to admit that fracking does indeed cause earthquakes. So it seems like they can only maintain that for a certain amount of time, eventually the evidence um, piles up. Another example would be mass surveillance. So prior to Snowden's revelations, we were told that experts who were sur had surmised that mass surveillance was occurring, including Julian. I mean, it was discussed in the Cypherpunks episodes prior to Edward Snowden's disclosures. Um, that that was abject conspiracy theory. Of course, they're not spying on everyone. You must be paranoid, blah, blah, blah. Sure enough, we find out from Snowden that... Um, it was not, in fact, conspiracy theory all along. So it seems to me that at that turning point, when they can no longer use conspiracy theory to um, to convince people not to investigate any further, um, that that is when they flip and we get the actually it's good for you, it's for your own good, your own protection line. And that I'm talking about in the mass surveillance context, that is um, uh, nothing to fear, nothing to hide. You know, well, yeah, so that's that's why, true. Why would you be Why would you be concerned? We we go we go from don't be concerned because it's not real to but why would you be concerned? It's totally acceptable, and I think that that relates to what you were just explaining. Well, that's certainly the case with the mass surveillance, uh, uh, the topic of mass surveillance, but it's not the case with um, a whole range of other uh, forbidden topics that continue to be. Uh, attacked, uh, not now as conspiracy theory per se, although the phrase is still used all the time, but as fake news. Fake news is, is, is the bellow of outrage that is, that it was, it's a kind of, uh, this, it's the son of conspiracy theory. It's conspiracy theory 2.0 is fake news. If you do a search on that phrase used pejoratively, and I don't mean by Donald Trump, but by the mainstream press that attacks mm -hmm. Donald Trump for everything he says, you'll find that it's 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 uh, it, 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 it's it's everywhere. It's still being used all over the place. I, I think do that, think it kind of backfired somewhat, though, because the first use of that was by Hillary Clinton during the campaign, and it was not very long at all before she was being, you know, New York Times was being called fake news. Yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely. It 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 has it has backfired. But the important point here is that, that the conspiracy theory meme, you know, the conspiracy theory cudgel, uh, whether it's, it, it goes by the name of conspiracy theory or goes by the name of fake news, uh, is doomed not just because there's a certain amount of time after which it doesn't work anymore. It's doomed because of, you know, the radical cultural and social change uh, induced by digital media. You know, we, we now have young people who uh, are, are, they grew up in digital culture. They are online all the time. And the beautiful thing about that, I mean, there are many aspects of it that are not beautiful, 
But the really beautiful and promising thing about digital culture is that the other side of the story is available to you in seconds, just by, you know, a few Hi. you know uh, keystrokes, right? You can now get your, you can get hands on the other side or sides of the story uh, very, very easily. Whereas 50 years ago, if you wanted to get the other side of the story of Kennedy's assassination, you'd actually have to hit the road. I mean, you'd have to go, you'd have to travel. You'd have to go meet with witnesses. You would have to go and check uh, archives and libraries uh, in certain places. You don't have to do that anymore. Now, And then can, even, even having done so would, to a certain extent, raise your profile. Well, that's right. It was dangerous to do. Well, it's yes. dangerous to do what we're doing, too, because every keystroke every word we speak to each other, we're, we're in a goldfish bowl. Nevertheless, the fact of the matter is that the job that they have in trying to protect the propaganda narrative, whether it's the narrative of Dallas 63 or the narrative of Russiagate, whatever it is, that job is infinitely more difficult for them because it is so easy for all the rest of us, not only to find the other side of the story, but to talk to each other. Now, as we made clear through our exchange today, there's a tremendous amount that they can do and are doing to try to inhibit us, to try to punish us and silence us. And the, uh, you know, what they've done to Julian is, is, is an egregious example of that. Uh, the other things we've talked about are further examples of that attempt, but I do believe, and I want to end on a hopeful note, I do believe that that attempt is doomed. I think the dam is finally breaking. You know, I think it is impossible for them to keep this up. They cannot keep telling us that we have to believe either we have to believe them or over our own eyes. OK, because people ultimately when people find that the propaganda they've been absorbing all this time is is spectacularly contradicted by their own experience. Once they see that, the propaganda is finished. It is over. It doesn't work anymore. Yeah. And it cannot be revived. You cannot save it. You cannot put it together again. It's broken. It's finished. And I like to think that the same is true of the elites that are behind the propaganda. They have too much wealth. They have too much power. They've done too much evil. They're doing too much evil now the way of life they've given us is too painful and too destructive and too impossible to pay for on our part. Uh, so that, you know, what we have to do is find ways to move all of us beyond mere suspicions that they're lying to us, mere, the mere intuition that we're being lied to, to a real knowledge that we're being lied to, to real factual awareness of what the truth is, and from that to the crucial realization that this can all be changed, mm. that you know, the promise of, of democracy is, 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 is a, a, not only a legitimate promise, but a necessary promise, that we can change this. And we can change this, but we cannot change it if we don't face the facts, if we don't accept the truth, if we don't tell the truth. Now, that's what Julian Assange has been doing. That has been his heroic mission, and he's being horribly punished for it. And I want to tell him, I suppose, something that he'll take in when he gets to watch this, this uh, conversation of ours, that the fact that he is being treated so abusively, so wrongly, is in a way validation of what he's doing. It proves that he's right. It proves that what he's saying is true. He is right. I don't know to what extent that feels to him, like it's enough to make it up to him for what he's lost. Uh, I suspect he will see that. I don't want to talk about him as a martyr because he's not finished yet. But uh, the fact is that he has done a great, great thing. He is a great man. Uh, and um, his punishment is proof that he's been right. Absolutely, because they wouldn't per they would not persecute him in the way that they have had had he not truly been acting against their interests and in the public interest. Absolutely, um, that's wonderful thoughts. I I mean, Julian has said that he's very outcome focused, which um, 
he's I guess that's the strategist in him that's the chess player he he's very much focused on what is the net effect overall at the end and he doesn't see this as being the end he's still very very forward focused very future focused yeah um so where do you so you it's an interesting perspective that you feel really that you're you're quite optimistic. You think the genie's out of the bottle. The bottle it's not going back in the bottle. Society is changing as a result and evolving as a result. Um, what about the advent of advanced technologies in terms of censorship? Do you see that as being problematic to a positive outcome? Yeah, I, I don't know that I would say I'm quite optimistic. <laughs> I am cautiously optimistic. I, I think there are grounds for optimism. You know, I I I I, I feel optimistic. Uh, because of my teaching, you know, my students come into class. I teach courses on propaganda. They come into class. Their heads are filled with the same crap that fills everybody else's heads. And to get them to do their own investigations so that they come to see that what they've accepted is true is not true, to see them waken painfully to that realization is is very very gratifying on the other hand i feel for them because it's often it often makes life harder for them with their own friends and family so so we have a a very long way to go before that kind of awareness is um more widespread you know than just that group of students or other groups of students from coast to coast and elsewhere in the west there are obviously grounds for grave concern and reasons not to be too optimistic one of them is indeed the fact that as technology advances, it, it not only empowers the rest of us, but simultaneously gives the state uh, even more sophisticated means to uh, monitor and track us and manipulate our feelings and so on. I mean, we are, we're now reading about Amazon's providing law enforcement with this face recognition software. I mean, it's become, at least it's become a subject of uh, some protest and investigative journalism, but there is always that, okay? Meanwhile, we have to be aware of the fact that uh, uh, the environment is not improving, you know, the state of the earth is not, the world's not getting healthier as time goes on, it's getting sicker. Uh, Consumer culture is continuing to degrade it. Uh, you know, Fukushima's uh, outflow is mm. continuing to poison the water is something that the press never, ever mentions at all. They'll talk about Roseanne's tweets, but they won't talk about Fukushima, right? War is always a possibility. We've just discovered, thanks to a story in a, by Associated Press, which nobody picked up except military.com, that airmen working for NORAD, which is the system that controls our nuclear weapons, mm-hmm. have been dealing and taking LSD, Okay. That's kind of worrying, okay? There's clearly very, very deep and widespread corruption of the system across the board. It includes the medical professions. It includes academia. We could go on and on about this. All of this is grounds for tempering one's optimism. But if we restrict the conversation to the very important, I would say crucial issue of people recognizing the truth and being able to tell the difference between it and the lies that they've been fed, I think that if we focus on that crucial issue, we can be optimistic, okay? No matter how long it takes, the, the, the days of these exalted liars uh, are numbered, it seems to me. And it is our obligation to hasten the end of that system and the um, uh, destruction of that whole deceptive and and poisonous mythology that is an absolutely brilliant place to look, to leave it there um okay. i can trace my entire journalism career endeavor whatever you want to call it back to the moment that i realized that no member of the media was going to tell the truth about what was happening in my country and that that meant that they must have been lying or omitting, lying by omission about many other things throughout the course of my life. It was that understanding that flipped the switch in me that I understood I would have to take personal responsibility for spreading that truth because it was never going to come from the established infrastructure. So thank you so much for being here. It's absolutely delightful. I I feel like we have 
barely begun the conversation, even though we've been talking for an hour. So I really hope you will consider coming back. We're doing these streams uh, first weekend of every month okay. until there is some resolution around Julian's issue, um, Julian's political asylum, until okay. he's able to realise it and have his human rights restored. Thank you.